Section 14 of Toto's Merry Winter by Laura E. Richards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 13, Part 1 Green Jacket. It's green men, it's green men, all in the wood together. And oh, we're feared of the green men in all the sweet May weather. Only I'm not feared of him meself, said Eileen, breaking off her song with a little merry laugh. Wouldn't I be pleased to meet one of them this day in the wood? Sure, it'd be the luckiest day of me life. She parted the boughs and entered the deep wood, where she was to gather faggots for her mother. Holding up her blue apron carefully, the little girl stepped lightly here and there, picking up the dry brown sticks and talking to herself all the while, to keep herself company, as she thought. Then I make a low curchy, she was saying, like that one mother made to the Lord's lady yesterday, and the green man, he gives me a nod and... What's your name, me dear? says he. Eileen McCarthy, your honor's reverence, says I. No, I mustn't say reverence, because he's not a priest, eh? Your honor's grace would do better. And what would ye like for a present, Ellie? says he. And then I'd say, let me see, what would I have first? Oh, I know, I'd ask him, oh, what's that? A great big green grasshopper, caught be his leg in a spider's web. Wait a bit, poor creature, I'll let you free again. Full of pity for the poor grasshopper, Eily stooped to lift it carefully out of the treacherous net into which it had fallen. But what was her amazement on perceiving that the creature was not a grasshopper, but a tiny man, clad from head to foot in light green, and with a scarlet cap on his head. The little fellow was hopelessly entangled in the net, from which he made desperate efforts to free himself, but the silken strands were quite strong enough to hold him prisoner. For a moment Eileen stood petrified with amazement, murmuring to herself, Holy Saint Bridget! What will I do now at all? Sure, I never thought I'd find one really in life. But the next moment her kindness of heart triumphed over her fear, and stooping once more she very gently took the little man up between her thumb and finger, pulled away the clinging web, and set him respectfully on the top of a large toadstool which stood conveniently near. The little green man shook himself, dusted his jacket with his red cap, and then looked up at Eileen with twinkling eyes. "'Thank ye, my maiden,' he said kindly. "'Ye have saved my life, and ye shall not be the worst for it, if ye did take me for a grasshopper.' Eily was rather abashed at this, but the little man looked very kind, so she plucked up her courage, and when he asked, "'What is your name, dear?' "'Just for all the world the way I thought of,' she said to herself. Answered bravely, with a low curtsy, Eileen McCarthy, your honor's reverence, Grace, I mean. And then she added, They calls me Eily, most times at home. Well, Eily, said the green man, I suppose ye know who I am. A fairy plays your honor's grace, said Eily with another curtsy. Sure, I've often heard of your honor's people, but I never thought I'd see one of yees. It's real pleased I am, sure enough. Many's the time Dr. O'Shaughnessy's told me there's no such thing as ye's, but I never believed him, Your Honor. That's right, said the green man heartily. That's very right. Never believe a word he says. And now, Eily, Alana, I am going to do ye a fairy's turn before I go. Ye shall have your wish of whatever ye like in the world. Take a minute to think about it, and then make up your mind. Eily fairly gasped for breath. Her dreams then had come true. She was to have a fairy wish. Could it possibly be true? And what should she wish for? The magic carpet? The goose that laid eggs of gold? The invisible cloak? Eily had all the old fairy stories at her tongue's end, for her mother told her one every night as she sat at her spinning. Jack and the Beanstalk, the Sleeping Beauty, the Seven Swans, the Elves that Stole Barney Maguire, the Brown Witch, and the witty Malone's pig. She knew them all, and scores of others besides. Her mothers always began the stories with, 
once upon a time, and a very good time it was, or long, long ago, when King O'Toole was young, and the Pratties grew already billed in the ground, or one fine time when the fairies danced, and not a poor man lived in Ireland. In this way, the fairies seemed always to be thrown far back into a remote past, which had nothing in common with the real workaday world in which Eily lived. But now, oh wonder of wonders, now here was a real fairy, alive and active, with as full power of blessing or banning as if the days of King O'Toole had come again, and what was more, with good will to grant Eileen McCarthy whatever in the wide world she might wish for. The child stood quite still, with her hands clasped, thinking harder than she had ever thought in all her life before. And the green man sat on the toadstool and watched her, with eyes which twinkled with some amusement, but no malice. "'Take your time, my dear,' he said. "'Take your time. You'll not meet a green man every day, so make the best of your chance.' Suddenly, Eily's face lighted up with sudden inspiration. "'Oh!' she cried. "'Sure, I have it, your reverence, grace, uh, honor, I should say. "'I have it. "'It's the diamonds and pearls I'll have, if ye please.' "'Diamonds and pearls,' repeated the fairy. "'What diamonds and pearls? "'There are a great many in the world. "'You don't want them all, surely?' "'Oh, no, your honor,' said Eily. "'Only one of each to drop out of me mouth every time I speak. "'Like the girl in the story, you know.' Whenever she opened her lips to speak, a diamond and a pearl of the richest beauty dropped from her mouth. That's what I mean, plays your honor's grace. Och, wouldn't it be beautiful, entirely? Humph, said the fairy, looking rather grave. Are ye quite sure this is what ye wish for most, Eileen? Don't decide hastily, or ye may be sorry for it. Sorry, cried Eileen. What for would I be sorry? Sure, I'd be richer than the Countess of Kilmoggan herself, let alone the Queen, by the time I talked for an hour. And I love to talk, she added softly, half to herself. The green man laughed outright at this. Well, Eily, he said, ye shall have your own way. Stoop down to me here. Eileen bent down, and he touched her lips three times with the scarlet tassel of his cap. Slanager Banniger, he said. The charm is worked. Now go home, Eileen McCarthy, and the good wishes of the green men go with ye. Ye will have your own wish as soon as ye cross the threshold of ye home. But hark ye now, he added impressively, a day may come when ye wish with all your heart to have the charm taken away. If that ever happens, come to this same place with a sprig of holly in your hand. Strike this toadstool three times, and say, Slanager Banniger, Skeen na lane. And now good-bye to ye. And clapping his scarlet cap on his head, the little man leaped from the toadstool and instantly disappeared from sight among the ferns and mosses. Eileen stood still for some time, lost in a dream of wonder and delight. Finally, rousing herself, she gave a long happy sigh, and hastily filling her apron with sticks, turned her steps homeward. The sun was sinking low when she came in sight of the little cabin at the door of which her mother was standing, looking anxiously in every direction. "'Is it yourself, Eily?' cried the good woman, in a tone of relief, as she saw the child approaching. "'And where have ye been at all? It's a wild colleen ye are to be sprankin' about her this way, and it's nearly sundown. Where have ye been, I'm askin' ye?' Eily held up her apron full of sticks, with a beaming smile but answered never a word till she stood on the threshold of the cottage. Sure, I might lose some, she had been saying to herself, and that'd never do. But as soon as she entered the little room, which was kitchen, hall, dining-room, and drawing-room for the McCarthy family, she dropped her bundle of faggots, and, clasping her hands together, cried, Och, mother, what do you think? Sure, you'll never believe what I tell ye. Here she suddenly stopped, for... Plop! Two round shining things dropped from her mouth and rolled away over the floor of the cabin. Holy Michael be me guide! cried Mrs. McCarthy. What's that? It's marbles! shouted little Fellum, jumping up from his seat by the fire 
and running to pick up the shining objects. "'Eily's got her mouth full of marbles! Hurroo!' "'They aren't marbles,' said Eily indignantly. "'Wait till I tell ye, Mother Ashore. I win to the forest as ye bade me to gather sticks and—' Hop-plop! Out flew two more shining things from her mouth and rolled away after the others. Mrs. McCarthy uttered a piercing shriek, clapped her hand over Eileen's mouth. "'She's bewitched!' she cried. "'Me child's bewitched! And spitten buttons! Och, where, where, what'll I do at all? Run, fellum, she added, and call your father. He's in the pratty patch, likely. And ye keep still, she said to Eily, who was struggling vainly to free herself from her mother's powerful grasp. Keep still, I'm tillin' ye, and don't open your lips. It's savin' your body and soul I may be this minute. St. Bridget, St. Michael, and blessed St. Patrick, she ejaculated piously. "'Save me, child, and I'll serve ye on me knees the rest of me days.' Poor Eily! This was a sad beginning of all her glory. She tried desperately to open her mouth, sure that in a moment she could make her mother understand the whole matter. But Honor McCarthy was a stalwart woman, and Eily's slender fingers could not stir the massive hand which was pressed firmly upon her lips. At this moment her father entered hastily, with Phelim panting behind him. "'What's the matter, woman?' he asked anxiously. "'Here's Phelim claim out of his head, and screamin' about Ellie and marvels and buttons and I don't know what all. "'What ails the child?' he added in a tone of great alarm, as he saw Eileen in her mother's arms, flushed and disordered, the tears rolling down her cheeks. "'Oh, Dennis!' cried Honor. "'It's bewitched she is, clean bewitched, out of her sinuses and spikes buttons, out of her mouth, with every word she says.' Och, me child, me poor unfortunate child, who would do ye such an ill turn as this, when ye never harmed anybody since the day ye were born? Buttons, said Dennis McCarthy. What do ye mean by buttons? How can she spake buttons, I am asking ye? Sure ye're foolish yourself, honor woman. Let the colleen go, and she'll tell me what tis all about. Och, if ye don't believe me, cried honor, show them to your father, Philem. "'Look at two of em there in the corner, the dirty things!' Phelim took up the two shining objects cautiously in the corner of his pinafore, and carried them to his father, who examined them long and carefully. Finally he spoke, but in an altered voice. "'Let the child go, Honor,' he said. "'I want to speak to her. "'Do as I bid ye,' he added sternly, and very reluctantly his wife released poor Eily who stood pale and trembling, eager to explain, and yet afraid to speak, for fear of being again forcibly silenced. Eileen, said her father, it's plain to see that these things are not buttons, but jewels. Jewels, exclaimed Honor, aghast. Ay, said Dennis, jewels or gems, whichever you please to call them. Now what I want to know is, where did you get them? Oh, father, cried Eileen, don't look at me that away. Sure I've done no harm. I only... Hop, plop! Another splendid diamond and another white glistening pearl fell from her lips. But she hurried on, speaking as quickly as she could. I went to the forest to gather sticks, and there I saw a grain man, all the same like a hopper grass, caught be his leg in a spider's web, and when I let him free, he give me a wish to have whatever I liked best in the world. And so I wished, and I said... But by this time... The pearls and diamonds were hopping like hailstones all over the cabin floor, and with a look of deep anger and sorrow, Dennis McCarthy motioned to his wife to close Eileen's mouth again, which she eagerly did. To think, he said, as ever a child of mine should stale the Countess's jewels, and then tell me a pack of lies about them. Honor, them's the beads of the Countess's necklace that I was telling ye about, that I saw on her neck at the ball when I carried the washing up to the castle, and this misfortunate Colleen has swallowed them. Swallowed them? echoed Honor incredulously. How would she swallow em, and have em in her mouth all the time? And how would she get them to swallow, and the Countess in Dublin these three weeks, and her jewels with her? Shame on ye, Dennis McCarthy, to suspect your poor demented child of stealin'. It's bewitched she is, I tell ye. Look at the face of her this minute." Just at that moment the sound of wheels was heard, 
and Phelim, who was standing at the open door, exclaimed, "'Father, here's Dr. O'Shaughnessy driving past. Will I stop him? Maybe he would know.' "'Ay, stop him, stop him, lad!' cried both mother and father in a breath. Phelim darted out, and soon returned, followed by the doctor, a tall, thin man, with a great hooked nose, on which was perched a pair of green spectacles. Eileen had never liked Dr. O'Shaughnessy, and now a cold shiver passed over her as he fixed his speckled eyes on her, and listened in silence to the confused accounts which her father and mother poured into his ear. Humph, he said at last. Bewitched? Tis very likely. I've known many so of late. Let me see the jewels, as ye call them. The pearls and diamonds were brought, a whole handful of them, and poured into the doctor's hand, which closed suddenly over them, while his dull black eyes shot out a gleam under the shading spectacles. The next moment, however, he laughed good-humouredly, and turned them carelessly over one by one. "'Why, Dennis,' he said, "'it's aisy to see you've not had much experience of jewels, me boy, or ye'd not mistake these bits of glass and such for them. No, no, there's no jewels here, wherever the countesses are.' "'And these bits of trash drop out of your child's mouth, you tell me, every time she speaks?' "'Every time, Your Honor,' said Honor. "'Out they drops, and goes hoppin' and leapin' about the room, like they were alive.' "'I see,' said the doctor. "'I understand. This is a very serious case, Mr. McCarthy. A very serious case indeed, sir. And I'll be free to tell you that I know but one way of curin' it.' "'Och!' cried Mrs. McCarthy. "'What is it at all, Dr. Alanna? "'Is it a witch has overlooked her, or what is it? "'Och, me child, me poor demented child, "'will I lose ye this away? "'Och, och!' "'And in her grief she loosed her hold of Eileen "'and clapped her hands to her own face, sobbing aloud. "'But before the child could open her lips to speak, "'she found herself seized in another and no less powerful grasp, "'while another hand covered her mouth.' not warm and firm like her mother's, but cold, bony, and frog-like. Holding her as in a vice, Dr. O'Shaughnessy spake once more to her parents. "'I'll save her life,' said he, "'and maybe her wits as well, if the thing's possible. But it's not here I can do it at all. I'll take the child home with me to my house, and Mistress O'Shaughnessy will tend to her as if she was her own, and then I will try the experiment which is the only thing on earth can save her. Spearmint, said Honor. Sure, there's two, three kinds of mint growing here in our own dooryard, but I don't know if there's any of that kind. Will you make a tea of it, doctor? Or is it a poultice you'll be puttin' on her, to draw out the witchcraft like? Wish, wish, woman, said Dennis impatiently. Hold your prate, can't you? And the doctor waitin'. Is there no way ye could cure her and lave her at home then, doctor? Faith, I'd be loath to have her go away from us like this, let alone the trouble she'll be to yous. No trouble at all, said the doctor briskly. At last, he added more gravely, now more than I'd gladly take for ye and ye good woman, Dennis. Come help me with the colleen now. Aisy does it. Now then, up with ye, Eily. And the next moment Eileen found herself in the doctor's narrow gig, wedged tightly between him and the side of the vehicle. "'Ye can send over her bits of clothes by Phelan,' said Dr. O'Shaughnessy, as he gathered up the reins, apparently in great haste. "'I'll not stop now. Good day to ye, Dennis. My respects to ye, Mistress McCarthy. You'll hear of the child in a day or two. And whistling to his old pony, they started off at as brisk a trot as the latter could produce on such short notice. "'Poor Eileen!' Was this the result of the fairy's gift? She sat still, half paralyzed with grief and terror, for she made no doubt that the hated doctor was going to do something very, very dreadful to her. Seeing that she made no effort to free herself or to speak, her captor removed his hand from her mouth, but not until they were well out of sight and hearing of her parents. Now, Eileen, he said, not unkindly, if you'll be a good colleen and not speak a word, I'll leave your mouth free. But have you speak so much as to say bless you, I'll tie up your jaw with my handkerchief, so you can't open it at all. Do you hear me now? 
Eileen nodded silently. She had not the slightest desire to say, Bless ye, to Dr. O'Shaughnessy. Nor did she care to fill his rusty old gig, or to sprinkle the high road with diamonds and pearls. "'That's right,' said the doctor. "'That's a sensible girl as ye are. See now, what a fine bit of sweet cake Mistress O'Shaughnessy will be giving ye when we get home.' The poor child burst into tears, for the word home made her realize more fully that she was going every moment farther and farther away from her own home, from her kind father, her anxious and loving mother, and dear little Phelim. What would Phelim do at night, without her shoulder to curl up on and go to sleep, in the trundle bed which they had shared ever since he was a tiny baby? Who would light her father's pipe, and sing him the little song he always liked to hear while he smoked it after supper? These, and many other such thoughts, filled Eileen's mind as she sat, weeping silently beside the green-speckled doctor, who cared nothing about her crying, so long as she did not try to speak. After a drive of some miles, they reached a tall, dark, gloomy-looking house, which was not unlike the doctor himself, with its small greenish window panes and its gaunt chimneys. Here the pony stopped, and the doctor, lifting Eileen out of the gig, carried her into the house. Mrs. O'Shaughnessy came out of the kitchen, wiping her hands on her apron, and stared in amazement at the burden in her husband's arms. "'Honor McCarthy's Eily!' she exclaimed. "'The saints protect us. Is she killed, or what's the matter?' "'Open the door of the best room,' said the doctor briefly. "'Open it, woman. I'm telling ye.' And entering a large bare room, he set Eileen down hastily on a stool, and then drew a long breath and wiped his brow. "'I've got ye,' he said. "'Safe and sound. I've got ye now, glory for us.' and ye'll not leave this room until ye've made me King of Ireland. End of section 14